Welcome back, everybody. This is DDP, and with WrestleMania on the horizon, I think I'm feeling pretty dangerous. So we're going to go through a quick rundown here on this very brief edition of Feeling Dangerous. We're going to go through a brief rundown of the card. I'm going to give you my picks for WrestleMania 35. Uh, you will get the Sports Series picks on their channel if you are watching both things by chance. And then Sunday during WrestleMania, all seven and a half hours of that broadcast, including some pre-show stuff, not the WrestleMania pre-show. Pre-show is in me and the Sports Fury talking and previewing the event. Basically, I'm going to be live streaming with the Sports Fury all WrestleMania day, it feels like. And we're going to give you our reactions, our thoughts, our analysis, a little bit of commentary, I guess, not a whole lot, but pretty much the ultimate WrestleMania stream companion this Sunday for WrestleMania 35 from MetLife Stadium. Now, let me dive right into the thick of it here. Let's start talking about this card. This is a stacked card, and when I say stacked, I mean there's like 15, 16, 17 matches on this biatch. There are so many matches, and there were still great matches that got cut, or at least uh, great superstars who got kind of thrown out into the cold. Asuka, looking at you, you were supposed to have a women's championship defense, and then they said, hey, uh, let's continue to push these three and forsake the rest of the women's division. Asuka, you're now in the the women's battle royal because we can't say it's the Fabulous Mula one. Understandably so. Correct decision. I'm just interested in the fact that they've still made no attempt to rename it uh, something else. You know, don't call it the Fabulous Mula. Hell, call it the Mae Young. Well, they already got the Mae Young uh, classic, don't they? Whatever. There are other revolutionary women in the sport that you could probably look at. So, I digress. Uh, Women's Battle Royal. I don't honestly care that much. It's going to be, to me, one of two people who wins this. It's either going to be Asuka, who this would be like a very small consolation prize for her losing her championship two weeks before WrestleMania and having a match on the card that she was working toward, working toward, working toward, being basically taken from her abruptly. This would either be her moment or her challenger, who was going to be her challenger before the change in plans, Mandy Rose. Now, Asuka makes more sense to me, but they are pushing Mandy Rose pretty hard. My problem with this is you have to think in terms of the storyline moving on beyond Mania, regardless of the events of the Ronda Charlotte Becky match. And I got to think that there's still going to be some kind of feud. They're, they're not wanting Mandy Rose to feud with Asuka because it's Asuka. They only wanted it because she was the champion. So if Asuka's not the champion, does Mandy Rose now pivot to whoever else? Because you're not going to have a belt on whoever it is. So uh, I'm going to go wild card and say Mandy Rose. I was going to say Asuka, and now I've talked myself into taking an instant, not swerve into a ballsy pick, but just a, a pivot into a little bit more of a reach, I guess. Pivoting now, Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Oofa! Uh, you know, they wanted to put over Apollo Crews on Raw, but I don't see that being the case. Uh, Braun Strowman's in it, so are the hosts of SNL. Those two guys from SNL, I should say. I don't see, I don't see Braun Strowman winning it. I think his stock is continuing to fall within the company. I think they're probably going to give that to maybe Apollo Crews. The thing is, there's a bad history for the winner of this match. Only the big show didn't get ultimately buried by winning it. I mean, Matt Hardy didn't get buried. He just was physically broken, no pun intended, and uh, had to take a brief retirement. So I'm going to go on a limb and say Apollo Crews just, I don't know, he's around. He seems like a good... Uh, employee kind of guy and never seems to complain, at least publicly. So I'm going to say they throw him a bone. Uh, next, we take a look at the uh, ooh, Women's Tag Team Championship match. Uh, well, actually, here, I, I skipped the Cruiserweights. Let me talk about that. Tony Nese versus champion Buddy Murphy. Buddy Murphy has had a very long title reign here. I think he's good, but I think they've had the belt on him a while. I'm going to say you get a changing of the guard here with Tony Nese taking the championship. Now, on to the Women's Tag Team Championship match. We have the Divas of Doom. 
Nia Jax and uh, Tamina, which is like, eh, lackluster. It's pretty much botch mania, but, you know. Uh, you have them taking on the Iconics. Uh, oh, no, Divas of Doom. What am I saying Divas of Doom for? Nia Jax and Tamina are their own team. Divas of Doom. Divas of Doom. Why am I blanking on their actual name? Are they that irrelevant? Whatever, it's not the Divas of Doom winning. I'm going to say they keep it on the Boston Hug connection for just a little longer. Uh, and then we got next, the SmackDown Live Tag Team Championships. The Bar versus Shinsuke and Rusev versus Ricochet and Aleister Black versus the champions, the Usos. Uh, I like Aleister Black and Ricochet a lot. I, I know that they were working together even with NXT before coming up to the main roster. I ultimately think they can go further individually, though, but they might run with them for a little bit because storyline-wise, they got nothing for them otherwise right now. The Usos, I think, are probably going to retain. They haven't been champions that long. So I'm going to say the Usos. Now that they've signed a new contract, that's usually the tip. If they hadn't signed the new contract, I would have had them dropping it, but they did sign new contracts just the other day. So I'm going to say the Usos retain. Probably pinning Rusev, knowing how WWE treats him. Next, we're going to take a look at the Intercontinental Championship match. We have the Demon Finn Balor. Demon King Finn Balor versus uh, Bobby Lashley, the champion. I got to tell you, man, when Bob Bobby Lashley came back, I was like came back to WWE. I was pretty excited. I thought his first run was pretty damn lackluster, but I was intrigued to see what they could do with him because during his time away, whether that was with Impact Wrestling or wherever, I felt like he grew a lot as a performer, not just in the ring, but on the mic. Unfortunately... WWE has done nothing good with him at all, at all. Yeah, he's had a couple Intercontinental Championship reigns, but I, I don't think it's that interesting or uh, compelling of a character or a story or anything. We know the Demon never loses. The Demon even got ruined for me on this last Raw, though, when Balor transforms into him on the big screen and then has to give you the... <sighs> What what the fuck was that, WWE? How, how are you going to ruin the character? Just have him... If you want him to be intense, just have him lower the pitch of his voice, the tone of his voice, and just be menacing. Or don't have him speak at all. You know what I mean? Have him, even if he just kind of like... Seed, like... <sighs> I would have taken that. But as soon as you go into like the weird, like, uh, make, a, make a gross face and be like an animal, like... <sighs> No, no. Uh, Demon King never loses. They're finally giving us the Demon King entrance at WrestleMania. It's in a stadium, though, so I hope it's at night when he gets his entrance because uh, that the aesthetic of his entrance will be completely and utter, utterly ruined otherwise. I'm going to say the Demon King wins in this match over Bobby Lashley and is the new Intercontinental Champion. Next, United States Championship, Samoa Joe and Rey Mysterio. Smojo's first WrestleMania, you're going to have, I'm guessing, a lot of people chanting, Joe, Joe, Joe. And uh, he deserves better, man. He's had to eat a lot of shit in his time on the main roster. He's had to take a lot of losses that aren't great. He always seems to be fooled as if he's, you know, a simple moron or something like that. Rey Mysterio doesn't need this win. Rey Mysterio doesn't need a United States championship at all at this stage in his career. I know that's not going to stop him because, you know, they put the belt on Jeff Hardy not too long ago, and he didn't need the title. So it's it's a toss-up. I'm going to say Samoa Joe wins this one. I'm going to give them some credit and assume that they partly right the ship. Next, AJ Styles versus Randy Orton. This is actually a slightly more compelling kind of storyline between these two like there's not a whole lot of depth to it other than randy just kind of initially talking shit to aj styles and then aj pretty much like i'll show you and now they've been going back and forth uh they both got some pretty good heat on each other this past smackdown the go home show for smackdown uh pretty much in which randy orton was talking shit about aj saying you know while you were in tiny ass gymnasiums and all of that the past however many years 
I was in WrestleMania. I was here. I was the youngest champion ever, you know, world champion, whatever, ever. He's talking about things like that. And yeah, there's some truth to that. Same time, let's not ignore the fact that you're a third generation superstar and pretty much had everything handed to you on a platter. In fact, your youngest world championship brain only became a thing because Brock Lesnar, the previous holder of that record, decided he was going to piss off Vince McMahon and WWE by backing out of his contract after WrestleMania 20. So his record was immediately going to be broken, and it was convenient storyline-wise to put you in that spot. Just throwing that out there. Uh, as far as the feud as a whole, AJ's... or let, let me say first, AJ's response to that I liked was pretty much like, yeah, you have been here 10 years, and you've still only learned one real move. Nice little dig. Uh, you know, Randy Orton, he's got his hangman's DDT, whatever he wants to call it, and his RKO. The RKO is one of the most protected finishers in WWE today. I don't think anybody ever really cuts out of it. it it's a nice-looking move. I don't know if I would say it's better than, like, the original Diamond Cutter, but it is a... Oh, well, I know that's not the original, but... Um, the Ace Crusher was the original. I think it's a devastating one, but I, I always look at it for Randy. I'm like, man, you take such a back bump doing it that way. <laughs> I got to think you're going to have back problems one day. Uh, Randy Orton is the long-established veteran. He's been there forever. I don't see them putting a championship back on him anytime soon, if at all. Maybe he'll get one more run at some point in his career. AJ has already had his WrestleMania moment last year, defending against Shinsuke uh, and winning, retaining his championship, his WWE championship. So uh, I would really like them not to re repeat the same uh, springboard forearm um, attempt that's reversed into an RKO. We see it too much, man. The phenomenal elbow or phenomenal forearm, that's what I meant. Uh, we see that way too much. I don't want to see it again as the finish of this match i want to see which they've done once before where aj pops up like he's gonna jump randy jumps up like the jackass he is crashes on his back and aj just kind of like lands on his feet because he never actually jumped off the ropes he just kind of drops back to the mat and just kind of points to the crowd and now he was a heel when he did did at that time but i'd like to see that have randy take a back bump uh hold his head and then while he's down aj hit the 450 splash springboard 450 and uh win it that way that'd be cool but that said, I think that they're going to have Randy Orton win in this case. I think AJ is going to lose. There's nothing really other than pride and other than the fact of saying like, oh, his WrestleMania win-loss record. I, th I think Randy Orton's got enough politicking bullshit behind the scenes that he'll probably get that moment. Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre, the match that not too long ago, I mean, obviously before Roman Reigns had to vacate the Universal Championship due to going, having to go back in for leukemia treatment, uh, this was what I thought was going to be the Universal Championship match, and I am a huge fan of Drew Galloway. I think that they are doing a lot with him. I said Drew Galloway. I just said his indie name. Drew McIntyre. Uh, I think there is a lot of potential there that they can that they can really make him a monster heel, and not in like the failed monster heel way they did with Braun Strowman. I think you can make him a legit top of the card uh, champion, heel champion, uh, and they're really pushing him hard to get him over in this case, uh, having him beat the snot out of Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose in recent weeks, jumping Roman Reigns like crazy. That said, I don't think his time is yet, because we know that they love them some Roman Reigns, especially Vince McMahon, he loves himself some Roman Reigns, he's going to want his guy, which is funny because Drew McIntyre was Vince's guy back in 2011, the guy he anointed a future all-time great before he utterly flamed out the first time through, reinvented himself on the indies, and then came back. Uh, I kind of wish they would have kept his indie name, Drew Galloway, because Drew McIntyre, uh, there's a lot of bad connotation there if you start looking back at the tape. <laughs> uh, they're never going to address that he, he lost a tag team title match with Hornswoggle involved. But I digress. Uh, Roman's first match, for, uh, not his first match, but his first big match back post-leukemia. Uh, I think they're going to put Roman over in this case. Now, they might have Roman win the match, but have Galloway still just destroy him. Uh, try and keep that heat on Galloway. I keep saying Galloway. Keep that heat on McIntyre and keep him 
uh, over in that regard, make sure that he doesn't lose much momentum. That would be smart, but I don't know. That's sometimes easier said than done. Uh, the best thing they can do is not continue to drag out this feud, I imagine. Mania is supposed to be where uh, feuds go to blow off, and instead, now, especially with this one starting so late, I don't think it's going to be that way at all. I think it's going to be a situation where we're going to have another match and then maybe another match. I mean, who knows? I As long as they don't drag this out too long, keep the intensity, keep the heat on Galloway, the whole Scottish psychopath thing, that's working for him. Stick with it, but Reigns is going to win this match. Falls count anywhere. Shane McMahon versus The Miz. Uh... I get the storytelling they're doing here, but I don't care about this match very much. Shane McMahon, like, the question every year, like, okay, what's he going to jump off of this year? What's he going to do this year? It's, I don't have an issue with him having matches. I hated when they did Shane versus AJ. I thought that was a waste of AJ, although they put forward a very good match. I still just don't think it's a great match. I think Shane can get a lot out of his matches when paired with the right guy, like when he was wrestling an Angle or an AJ or someone like that. He can get a lot out of it. Miz, I, I don't think of him as a great wrestler. I think of him as a good wrestler. Uh, but Miz sucks as a face, dude. He just does. Like, the thing is, he already has a punchable face, <laughs> and he has the face of, like, a 12-year-old. And so when you then take that a step further and say, now you got to cheer him. Like when they had him start doing the figure four and Ric Flair was briefly not his manager, but kind of, sort of. Uh, it's just weak. It's weak. Miz is a good heel, can be a great heel. But I don't like face Miz versus heel McMahon. Um, it's the blow-off match. I think Miz is going to go over and Shane's going to what? Like what does Shane lose from this? He's just going to get his ass kicked and either it dies there or he'll get revenge by having Miz eat shit and get the, you know, put him in ridiculous matches or something. I don't know. I don't care. Miz is going to win, though, uh, as it should be. Kurt Angle versus Baron Corbin, Angle's retirement match. You talk about disappointing. This, this matchup does not make sense to me. Like, there, yes, there was a symmetry to John Cena being Angle's opponent because John Cena's first main roster match was against Kurt Angle. That's what launched him when he was still ruthless aggression. <laughs> when he's trembling as he's uh, answering uh, Kurt Angle's challenge of like, well, it makes you so different or whatever before their match. It, it's just, that would have been perfect symmetry. They're keeping John Cena's match a secret. They will not tell us what John Cena's match is going to be. I kind of think there's a couple things that can come from this. So for Baron Corbin, first of all, they've not built him up. This seems like a ham-fisted way of trying to fix this. They've been feeding Baron Corbin to scrubs for a while now, and now it's going to look bad no matter what. Baron Corbin can't win in this situation. Like Either he beats Kurt Angle, who himself has been jobbed out to other people recently, and who in his last match is clearly... Not that impressive of a wrestler anymore. Physically, his body is just too beat up. He can't even stand perfectly straight. So yeah, it's there's nothing to gain there. Corbin doesn't gain heat unless he like sends him out on a stretcher, which how mortifying. I don't know that they would do that to Kurt on his last ma in his last match ever. So that's one way you could get heat on Corbin. Just have him go so over the top and excessive. Have it be like he's been, you know, that he's just finally snapped, sick of dealing with all this shit and all the disrespect and all that he gets. Uh, but if he loses to to Kurt, he looks even worse. Because like I said, Kurt's been getting jobbed out lately. And Corbin was never a fit opponent for Kurt. Yes, narratively speaking, there's been tension there and they've not had a match to blow off that stuff. But because of circumstances, I think this would have made a better swerve. You know what a better swerve to it would have been? If Kurt had had a real opponent... But then they had said that Corbin was going to be like the special guest referee. That would have added tension and that would have made it more difficult. Uh, still gives Corbin a way to try and screw Kurt over. And I don't know, maybe Corbin would preemptively uh, cheat Kurt or cost him the match. And then somebody else doesn't have to be Vince. Maybe it's Stephanie who they have waffle between 
if she's a healer face too much. Uh, maybe someone comes out and basically says, no, nope, Kurt's last match isn't ending that way. Um, you know, Kurt lays out Corbin, and then she's like, nope, his last match isn't ending that way. Get me a real official, restart the match, and then Kurt wins from there. I don't know. That would make sense. Corbin still eats shit. Uh, still looks like he was a conniving heel in the situation. And Kurt gets a proper send-off with a little bit of a swerve at the end. So I, I would have liked that better. This match in general, like I said, Corbin can't benefit from it unless he puts Kurt on a stretcher or something. I think it's going to be Kurt that wins, and I think Corbin will continue his borderline freefall in the in the wake of being a legitimate superstar and a significant on-screen persona other than a cheap, not-that-effective uh, heel. Uh, let's see. From there, we have No Holds Barred, Triple H versus Batista. Triple H has done everything in this business except beat Batista, apparently. The last promo package from Batista on the Go Home Raw made that point abundantly clear. Now, what I like about that, I actually think that was a really good promo, really, because it was so simple, but it feeds into that. Batista, kind of like Roman Reigns and other uh, you know, powerhouse baby faces, or I know Batista's the heel in this case, they're better when they're men a few words. When they just come in, kick ass, don't don't sit there and talk. They damn sure don't pull a Roman Reigns suffering succotash. Uh, they don't wink to the camera. They don't do cheesy little shit like that. I get it. That's the writers, but still. Uh, for Batista, it made all the sense in the world. Literally, it's just, I'm going to put up evidence on the screen showing you every reason why you can't and never have beaten me. And then at the end of all of that, after that, you know, minute or so clip of just him beating the hell out of Triple H, pinning him, retaining championships, winning championships. Cuts back to Batista. He dramatic pauses. Camera focuses dead center on him, and he looks at it just straight into the camera. Says, Hunter, kiss my ass. Drops the mic. Perfect. Perfect. That is exactly how you maximize, a sh you know, just literally as brief of a promo as you can really be. But it's so effective. If he had gone on some long-winded diatribe or something like that about, like, when we were in evolution, you always resented me. And, like, we've already kind of covered that ground anyway. And there's nothing to gain from it. Rehashing shit isn't going to do anything at this point. So doing, I know, the promo packages was obviously in some degree rehashing. But that's different to me. I'm talking about rehashing as in story time, not as in, here's a montage of me beating the shit out of you. That's a little bit different. I give that more weight. Therefore, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, ooh, yeah, Triple H's career is on the line. I was about to say Batista, but if Triple H's career is on the line, I doubt this is it. This is, you got to think too, if Triple H has never beaten Batista, what do we know about Triple H's ego and him fighting for the, uh, the honor of Ric Flair? Tr Triple H is going to win. Triple H is going to win. Uh, this could actually be a not so great match. I think they made it no holds barred one to try and add a little bit of edge to it. Like, Oh, this is how heated it's gotten. No holds barred. Who knows what's going to happen. But my problem with that is that also can be used as a way to mask the fact that it's not going to be that good of a match. Like when you can't put on as entertaining and engaging of a match, sometimes you'll see them go, ah, f ah fucking hardcore hit him with a chair Hit him with a ladder. Hit him with a sledgehammer. Like, you'll see that kind of stuff. Put him through a table! You'll see that kind of crap all the time, and uh, I think that's going to be used a little bit more as a crutch. You know, Batista's had... He had a brief run in, what was it, 2013, 2014? Whenever he was Blue Tista, he had a brief run from that year's Royal Rumble through Mania. Um, was it really that short? Just a few months? I think it was. Ugh. <laughs> but um, now nah, I went a little further because they did the whole rivalry with the Shield, Evolution versus the Shield. Regardless, not uh, not high on Batista's chances here. They're gonna have Triple H get his win back because Triple H probably wants his win back. And Triple H has lost a lot at WrestleMania in recent years too. I don't see that continuing. They got to do something to right the ship, and this is a way, of probably in Triple H's eyes, of Batista repaying him for mentoring him or something. Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan. Ooh la la. WWE Championship match. 
This is a great storyline that fell into WWE's lap. I actually have, I'm actually excited for this match. And, you know, Kofi got plugged into the Elimination Chamber match for Mustafa Ali, now just known as Ali, because Randy Orton pretty much botched a boot and kicked him in the eye. And so he was injured and had to miss the match. Kofi came out and shined. I think that initially in terms of Kofi being the last guy eliminated, I think he basically just got the micro push that Mustafa Ali was going to get. And it just worked out for him because the crowd responded so well to him that suddenly you had this just organic Kofi mania sweep through. Poor Mustafa Ali probably missed out on a huge career opportunity and it wasn't even his fault. But uh, they've, they've done a pretty good job of running with it since then. Now, you know, they, they've waffled a little bit. Uh, I think that one of the problems WWE has had is they've neglected a lot storyline wise, neglected a lot of the undercard action and on the main card, um, like the highlights, the main event kind of pictures, they've over meddled in those, uh, Vince McMahon coming out and taking Kofi out of the match first, giving his initial title shot to, a returning Kevin Owens, which is weird too, because Kevin Owens should have heat with Vince after beating the snot out of him a year or so earlier. Uh, he gives that away, and then he makes go- Kofi go through this gauntlet match, and then Kofi gets through the initial gauntlet, but then he adds one more match. He loses that match. Uh, then it's another dramatic thing where it's like, all right, now you can't compete, but the New Day can. Uh, okay, so we got a tag team gauntlet match, but Kofi's not involved. I thought that one was really, really stupid, honestly. Like, I get it. You want to try and push the whole new day and not just Kofi in this case. But it was weird to me having Kofi not not be involved in it that way, where he's literally just in the back. He's not even ringside watching. He's not on commentary. He's nothing. He's just out of sight, out of mind for like an hour of SmackDown, basically, until all those matches wrap up and then he can come out and celebrate. And it's like... For that to be the final hurdle, I thought was kind of weak, but it is what it is. Kofi is in the match. Do I think Kofi Kingston wins the WWE Championship at WrestleMania? It would be a great story. He's been with the company 11 years, been a good soldier and all that. I don't think so, though. I, I don't think... The difference between... you know People talk about the parallels between this and Daniel Bryan uh, at WrestleMania 30. The difference is there are that Daniel Bryan, there was months and months and months of this build for Daniel Bryan. He was getting screwed over at every turn. SummerSlam, I think there was a case even before that. The whole B-plus player thing was out there way longer. Kofi kind of happened just in the last month or so, and I don't think it's had the time to reach that now. WrestleMania is supposed to be the blow-off for this kind of stuff, but I don't think that they're behind Kofi in the sense of giving him the moment. I will say this, if I'm wrong, if they do put Kofi over, I think they're going to take the belt off him within the first month or so he has it. Within the first one to two months, tops, they put the belt back on Brian, and it's Brian and WWE giving Kofi this great, well-deserved WrestleMania moment, although they would probably also argue just having the match and a main event spot is already doing so, and they're going to go from there. Brian is the huge heel in this case. Credit to him for finding a way to get over as well as a as a devious heel after how over he was as a baby face for the last several years just to get back to the point of being... It, it's his best heel work yet because he's conniving and he's manipulative, but he's not the little snot that you just want to slap the taste out of his mouth that he was when he was getting over the no chant or whatever. Like He was the nerdy, geeky little heel initially. I loved him, but it it still goes to serve. That would not be near the heel that he is right now uh, if that was the version of him we had. So, uh, yeah, I think they're going to keep the belt on Daniel Bryan. That's going to be my prediction on that one. I'd love to see Kofi win. It's one I would happily take an L on, so to speak. But uh, I think it's going to be Daniel Bryan. Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship match. Here is a tough spot. Last year at WrestleMania, we had Roman versus Lesnar, same situation. And the swerve was, even though everyone had expected it, even though they'd been building to it, building to it, building to it, and the whole thing had been literally projected for more than a year, this is what they were going to do. 
they swerved at the last minute because WrestleMania, to their credit, no longer is a show where it's just, hey, you're a babyface, you go over. We want everyone to go home for the, the kind of year-end uh, happy note to send them off on. The baby faces conquer. No, they don't do that anymore. Now they like to swerve. Now they like to actually be a little bit more so 50-50 booking. Um, and, and I don't mean that in like the I beat you last week, so now you beat me this week. I don't mean that kind of 50-50 booking. I mean like faces and heels. It's usually fairly even how they trade that off. Uh, so... Reigns didn't go over last year. Got the tar beat out of him. Bloody, bloody mess. Um, The problem was how they've booked this one, too. Although they had Seth be like, nobody likes Brock Lesnar here. The fans don't like him. They don't respect him. I'm fighting not just for myself, but for all of them. That's always ham-fisted to me. It's always too heavy-handed of a way to get over. It's a cheap pop ironic from my other channel um but it's a cheap pop it's not something that feels as earned like they should organically get behind you not like i'm doing this for you not just me and you know seth they've barely been able to have him wrestle since the royal rumble because of a nagging back injury uh i think he's in a very compromised state we, he's had the two major knee injuries He's now got a nagging back injury in which they had to basically take every single precaution to shut him down between the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. Not completely, but for the most part. And as a result of that, they might not be willing to keep the belt on him. They clearly want to keep Brock Lesnar. They have plans for him beyond uh, WrestleMania. They don't want him going to AEW. And if that's the case, then it's like, ooh, uh, if Brock's not the Universal Champion, what is he even doing there anymore? You know what I mean? He's not showing up on Raw and SmackDown. You can't build anything around him. And because he's not there on Raw and SmackDown, it's that exact reason why it's been hard to build this match. It usually just turns into Paul Heyman talks for a little bit, and then Seth Rollins disputes it. Seth Rollins talks for a little bit, then Paul Heyman tries to dispute it, gets some good points in, but then Rollins disputes that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just back and forth. Who cares? Uh, They've shown no indication that Seth can win, even when they finally had him kind of get over on Brock. They still had it just be the result of two low blows, which is all anyone ever does against Brock. I know that obviously, clearly, logically it works, but it's just lazy. Like, I, I'm i getting my ass kicked. Let me just kick him in the nuts. Like, I want to see someone get the better of Brock, or at least outsmart Brock in a way that does not require that. Finn Balor was a good example of that. The, the whole midsection injury they had with him in his match against Brock not too long ago where he shoves Brock into the corner of the announce table and the point of it stabs Brock right in uh right in kind of the right between the ribs really. I thought that was well done. That's a way to get over and that's a way that a smaller guy, less imposing guy can beat Brock. I don't think they're going to repeat last year though. I don't. I think they're going to put Seth Rollins over and I think there's two reasons for that. Although there are questions about if Vince really believes in Seth. I know Triple H wholeheartedly does. I think that what they're going to say is that, you know, Seth Seth was a really good worker for us throughout his initial WWE Championship reign after his Money in the Bank cash-in, in which he beat Rock, Rock, Brock um, and Roman Reigns at a previous WrestleMania. I believe that was 32 Uh no, it was 31. I, yeah, whatever. In which he beat um, Brock and Roman Reigns. That's that's a good um, barometer to kind of set. But, you know, he lost the he lost the belt due to injury. They gave him about uh, not even a cigarette break's worth of time with it the second time after he came back and beat Reigns before Dean Ambrose cashed in on him. And they haven't put him in it since. Like, he's had a couple matches for the Universal Championship since then. I know he had a match for the inaugural Universal Championship against Finn Balor. But they haven't put the championship back on him since then. He's never held the Universal Championship. And so I think this is a way of saying, dude, you have been an absolute workhorse for us the past you know, two years or so since you've come back from this. I know you're dinged up and this does give me pause, but I think they're going to put him over because unless you're building for like Drew McIntyre to take on Brock, which by the way, how would you do that? Heel versus heel never works. You can get away sometimes with babyface versus babyface. Getting over heel versus heel is incredibly tough to do. 
So I, I don't know, man. I look at it that way as this is probably rewarding it, uh, rewarding him for his absurdly good work rate and all of that the past couple of years, not barring the last or barring the last uh, couple months. Another thing people talk about Vince, him not being a Vince guy, that Vince doesn't believe that he's a believable um, champion in this case, like a main eventer. Are you kidding me? Vince McMahon put over Shawn Michaels. They're like the same height and similar build. Like Vince had Shawn as his guy. You know, I know that even if Shawn's back injury didn't flare up and, and you know, that he was going to go to Austin no matter what, but he had Shawn in that role for a couple years. So why would he not look at Seth Rollins and have a somewhat similar opinion when they're both excellent in the ring? Uh, Rollins isn't quite, I would say, the promo guy that Sean was, but he's not, you know, he's not shabby either by any means. And uh, I think they can absolutely do that. Now, whether he's great at doing that as a babyface, I don't know. We've never gotten to see that. So that's a toss up. I'm going to say they still give it to Rollins. That's going to be my out on a ledge a little bit pick. And now the main event, the all women's main event. Oh, I'm not mentioning the John Cena match because I don't know who he's facing. So how can I predict it? John Cena wins. That's my prediction. I was going to mention earlier too, one of the chances for the Corbin match would be uh, Kurt squashes Corbin and then John Cena comes in and they have a real match. <laughs> that would be an interesting swerve. Uh, and if that if it was Kurt versus Cena, um, probably put over Cena this time because Kurt got over last time. I know it's Kurt's last match. Probably would recreate that moment a little bit, a small package or something to win. All women's main event now. Becky versus Ronda versus Charlotte. Overbooked. I have a million problems with this whole storyline, how they've done it. I'm going to address those in a more summary version now. Uh, first of all, I don't like it being a triple threat. I never liked it being a triple threat. I know that they were working this whole time until Survivor Series happened and Becky became a rock star. Uh, I know they were working for Charlotte versus Ronda, and that would have been a great match. At the time, that would have been a match I said, yeah, I'd like to see that. But then a swerve happened uh, due to Becky's injury due to Nia Jax. And so we got that at Survivor Series. And it was a great match, even before Charlotte turned heel and got herself disqualified and pretty much beat the holy hell out of Ronda Rousey. Great match. I enjoyed it. Uh, but I think this should have been a one-on-one -on -one contest after that. I think it should have been Charlotte versus Asuka uh, for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And then you could have built towards something because then if there was another... Um, I know they're kind of eventually doing away with the brand split. That's why this is now winner take all because they've already got you know one set of women's tag team champions or one set of women's tag team belts, and those Sasha and Bailey have just been floating between Raw and SmackDown, uh, and that purpose. They'll probably do the same now with the women's champion, and I don't know whether they'll eventually unify the U.S. and Intercontinental belts as well or the championship belts. That that gets a little hazy to me, but. Uh, Going this route, it would have made more sense if Charlotte had a rematch with Asuka in which Asuka avenged last year's WrestleMania defeat to Charlotte. It's ironic to me that Charlotte is who killed Asuka's run, all her momentum of two years of build of Asuka got ruined at the finish line uh, by the choice to have Charlotte go over last year. Now, I'll say this. In terms of the woman who beat her and the stage in which she was beaten, that was all appropriate. To have her lose on like a random Raw or SmackDown, I know it would have been SmackDown, uh, or some, you know, rat-ass pay-per-view like Fastlane. Who would have cared? No one. No one would have cared. So in that regard, I, I agree. But you got her to the utter complete finish line and then went like, ha-ha, swerve. Um, so that would have been good to have that rematch there have their feud continue, and then it should have been Charlotte, or sorry, it should have been Becky versus Ronda Rousey because that was the starting point. That was the genesis of the whole feud was Becky's SmackDown invasion of Raw right before Survivor Series. And, you know, she she directly went after Ronda 
both in the back to start the thing off. And then she waved in the troops to do the attack. And then she's the one who stood tall at the end, even with the busted face. So that's how it should have been. If they had Charlotte forced into there, I would have had something for her to either get removed from it eventually or something to that effect. Basically, I'm saying I would have teased it but not actually done it. But here we are now. We have a triple threat match. That wasn't even enough, so then they decided to cut the SmackDown Women's Championship match because they felt like there wasn't enough build. Basically saying, hey, we didn't do our homework well enough, so now we're going to just scrap this all together. Uh, Put the belt on Charlotte, and now it's winner take all. Okay, cool. Um, I know Vince's wet dream would be Charlotte holding both championships uh, to close out the show. Ronda Rousey, it sounds like, is leaving Raw or leaving WWE briefly um, after WrestleMania because she's going to start a family with her husband. That, If that's the case, okay. I don't think she's gone for good by any means, but if she's going to be gone for you know bare minimum... Uh, what are we talking at that point, a year? If she's not going to be around between the pregnancy and then the initial couple months after the kid's born and her having to get back in shape, I don't know. I don't know what the plan is there. So if she's going to be gone, it would be catastrophically bad if she is leaving to have her retain. Like, what? There, there is no option. She has to lose. And that's another thing people don't like about the inclusion of Charlotte is if they are going to put Becky over, if they are going to listen to the fans, she's been the hottest property in women's wrestling uh, really ever since Survivor Series, ever since she started the whole thing of I'm the man and all that, the man the man came around, all that. Um, if they're going to put it on her, the championship, there's talk that, oh, they're trying to protect Ronda by having Charlotte eat the pen or something. That could certainly happen, and that would be inf- infuriating if it does because it should be a proper, especially with Ronda gone, it should be a proper handoff at that point. Like it should be something where if Becky wins, it's not because she knocked her out. I don't even know if it should be that she tapped her. If she taps Rhonda, that would be like incredibly surprising. I think it should be something where she outsmarts her. I think Becky in this case would work better there because Becky of the three, she is the least physically imposing. She's a great wrestler. She's great on the mic. The best talker of the three, no doubt. But I think it would make sense, especially with her being kind of that tweener. Like, she's not really a heel, but uh, she'll still have some tendencies every now and then where you can tell she's, like, at least an anti-hero, kind of a modern-day female stone cold in that regard. So I, I think it would make sense for her to kind of outsmart Ronda or something like that if she gets a pen or whatever. Or if she's going to make someone tap, it'll probably be Charlotte. But that would make a lot of sense. I think Becky is probably who goes over. I I don't see a better solution than that because if Charlotte gets both championships, you literally just buried your entire main event because Charlotte was shoehorned in by some of, again, that over-meddling from the top, having Vince take Becky out of the feud. Like, first of all, Becky, you're suspended. All right, Becky, you're not suspended. Nope, Becky, you're suspended. 60 days, takes you two days through WrestleMania. Okay, oddly specific. Um, okay, now we're going to put you back in the match because Ronda Rousey's making a big show of it. Uh, even though you've only gotten more destructive since then, uh, acting out and all that. So now you're back in the match. Uh, oh, yeah, and when he took her out, he put Charlotte in, of course. Uh, okay, now you got to have this match to re-earn, even though you won the Women's Royal Rumble, you got to have this match to re-earn your place in WrestleMania's main event. And they weren't calling it the main event there, but the women's championship match. And uh, no matter what Charlotte's in, it's not the winner goes to WrestleMania, which would have been fine. But it's Charlotte's in no matter what. All she can do is improve her odds by keeping you out. Uh, And then they have Ronda intentionally uh, come in and punch Becky so that Becky wins via DQ. I mean, that was such a shit match and a blow off. And it makes no sense for Ronda. Like, Oh, okay, I know they make her a heel now, but what's the logic? Like, oh, I'd rather face two opponents and have the potential of losing in which I'm not even pinned or submitted. Okay, so now that's going to be your storyline? You're actually... Like, imagine if that's how they finish it with either Charlotte or Becky pinning or tapping the other out and Ronda losing her belt because of that. If they did that, I would literally... The next night on Raw, whether I was Becky or Charlotte... 
I would play that clip on loop. Uh, Ronda getting uh, Charlotte disqualified by hitting Becky so that Becky was in the match and then showing the end of the WrestleMania match. And I'd be like, well, Ronda, I'm glad you're going to start your family and everything, but I hope the kid doesn't inherit your brains. Something along those lines would be good. Like, you gave me an opening, I took it. I can't believe you actually were dumb enough to do that, but... You know, if it's Becky, she'd probably call her a little weirdo or something. Ronnie, you little weirdo. Um, something to that effect would work. <laughs> I mean, it, it's still stupid logic for Rhonda, but, you know, they're going off the angle of, oh, she's so uh, so confident, maybe even arrogant, that she can beat both of them herself, that she'll take them on. She even offered to do it in a handicap match, which, how would that work? But, you know, whatever. It's not going to be Ronda winning, I don't think. It's going to be Charlotte or Becky. It should be Becky. Charlotte has been handed a million and seven opportunities. She's already now talking about being a 16-time women's champion, ultimately. Uh, she's already tied for the record with Trish Stratus, I believe, at seven or eight. Um, if they go that route, and Charlotte's got like seven more years left, probably, at the rate she's going. I mean, good God. And with the way belts are hot potatoed these days... Oof, she could she could easily, easily beat her dad's record on the women's side of things. Hell, I wouldn't be shocked if they eventually got bold enough to try and put a, a like an intercontinental championship on a woman again, and it was Charlotte they chose. I mean, Ronda, if she's there, obviously makes some sense in that regard too, but I digress. That's just uh, kind of the thought process there. Becky should win this. Becky should close out the show, and if that's the case, if it goes... That route, that's a great feel-good moment for the fans. I know Kofi would also be a great feel-good moment, but I think in this case, it's been such a screwed-up path how they've gotten this match, this main event, to where it's at. You know, even even their brawl the other night uh, to close out Raw. Or it, sorry, close out Raw. It should have closed out Raw. It was the high point of the entire show, and then the last hour was like, what the fuck? Did I just rewind the start of the show? This is so boring. Get to the good stuff. It it was such a waste, such bad pacing. But that's that was cool. But there was definitely moments where you're just like, okay, guys, come on, come on. This is getting silly. Like putting them in the same car, the kick fight, kicking out the fake glass, hijacking the car. First of all, how? Second of all, why? It's not even like she like t turned the wheel toward them and their kicking fights were awkward. Like It was over-the-top crazy and stupid in all the best ways, so in that regard, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I, I kind of enjoyed it, but in other ways, I'm just kind of sitting here scratching my head like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, I want to see the match. I believe this is at a boiling point for the three women, but I don't know what it is we're doing here exactly, so... We'll see, man. We'll see how this pans out. But those are my predictions for WrestleMania 35. Tomorrow, no, tomorrow is Friday. Saturday, the Sports Fury will be giving you their picks. I think they have a guest on their show doing it then. So they'll give you their picks. I will be on then Sunday, probably as early as like 4.30. Jesus. 4.30 on uh, their stream with them. And we will be on until WrestleMania ends, probably sometime around 10, 10.30. Who knows, man? WrestleMania be psycho like that. But that's going to wrap it up for this show, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I've been DDP, and this is Feeling Dangerous. Salute.